Kathy for for the introduction. So thank you everybody for for being here and to what I have to say. I hope you find it interesting and don't hesitate to make any questions or contact me later on uh, afterwards if, if you want to discuss further some some matters. Um, so I will talk to uh, how we are using the machine learning algorithms in dermatology, but not only from an academic point of view, but how we are foreseeing to implement these algorithms in during a routine dermatology consultation with a real patient. Uh, so first I wanted to introduce uh, very briefly uh, the problem at hand. So we have mainly two different types of skin cancer. We have the good guys, which are the basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinomas. And I say the good guys because although there are cancerous uh, cells there, they don't uh, produce metastasis or they produce a metastasis much slower than the melanoma. Meaning that once they are detected, they can be removed uh, just by a excision and there shouldn't be any threat to the life of the patient. However, if you see the, this last photo, we have the, uh, sorry, the melanoma case. The, the melanoma is uh, the deadliest skin cancer because it, it produces metastasis quite fast. Meaning that if you leave the, the skin lesion to develop long enough, it will probably transmit into the bones, into the lab, into the brain, meaning that there the, the chances of survival of the patient are very slight. So our machine learning algorithm should be targeting mainly the diagnosis of this kind of issues. So if we look at the situation of Switzerland, it's particularly worrying because in the latest uh, data available, we are only behind Australia and New Zealand in number of cases of melanoma per 100k uh, citizens. So this is something that it should be a concern to everybody being a Swiss citizen or living in Switzerland. And uh, in the, uh, for that, it's important that we actually uh, try to adapt our tools uh, to be used during routine consultation to try to prevent, as apart from the from prevention that all the all the people have to have when they are exposed to sun, also prevent uh, prevent and diagnose as soon as possible the, the melanoma. So the melanoma starts with a very tiny spot that is very difficult to to detect, and then it starts growing in ta uh, as the time passes. And at some point, it will start also changing shape. And then it will appear some features, and then this feature will become more clear and clear, and then it will have really a very bad uh, look. So of, obviously, what we would like to do is to diagnose as soon as possible. But what happens? Here, I was, I was telling you that it's at the early stages, they really look like a normal skin lesion, maybe a fractal, or yes, a sunburn. So here, it's really difficult for even a board certificate certified dermatologist to diagnose this, this, uh, this lesion. However, even if it is difficult, this is, should be our aim to make the diagnosis in this early stage. Why? First, because of course, if, the pro if you do it in this early stage, the probability of that this uh, uh, melanoma has produced metastasis is, is much smaller, meaning that your probability of survival is higher. But as well, uh, even if there is no metastasis, you, the only way to remove these lesions it will be with some excision, meaning that you will, you will produce the patient a, a fairly large scar depending on the footprint of the lesion. Meaning that once the, the, the life of the patient is, is, is secure, let's say, the, the next step is try to minimize the, the part of the skin you have to remove so you can improve the life of your patient in the, in the, in the future. So, um, so we have now the opposite. Now, how can we diagnose the, the melanoma? So in the latest stages where the melanoma is very well developed, you can just simply see them with a magnifying glass because they are obvious and even you don't need to be a dermatologist sometimes. You can be in the, in the swimming pool and someone can stare at you at your back because there is something really bad looking. If you, uh, what normally happens for the diagnosis is that the dermatologists use these uh, dermoscopic lenses where you can see underneath the skin and already start seeing this structure that can help them to make a bit of early diagnosis. But still, here is already advanced and it 
can be already have metastasis. If we want to go to the very early uh, stages of the of the of the melanoma, first it goes beyond human capability because we, we cannot the, our eye of course even if we have these uh, dermoscopic lenses can only uh, see certain features but not all of them. So, but for that we have AI. I mean, the, the use of AI is, is mainly for that is trying to extract information that are beyond the human capabilities. And this is fine. Okay, then we could just use AI to try to diagnose as early as possible the melanoma. But the problem is we don't have data because, of course, the patients will only come to the dermatologist when they have, they already seen some symptoms. They see that there are some features. There is some. A size of the change of the size, or they, they see some change of colors, or maybe it, it's just a bit painful. So they only will start probably coming to the dermatologist in these cases, unless there are some risk uh, factors like genetics or other cases in the family or something like that. But if we want to do early diagnosis, we are missing the data. So in this uh, talk, I want to focus on two main points. First is how can we attack to the very early diagnosis? Is it possible? Well, first we need the data. And then we will need actually not only single point data, but longitudinal evolution. Because if you see a very symmetric lesion that can be in melanoma, you can only be sure if actually it's going to grow in the future. Then the other question that we want to address is how can translate all these um, AI models that academically perform very well. I mean, you can find many publications in Nature in very well renowned magazines where these models have outperformed dermatologists in this classification task. Of course, the condition of those uh, studies are a bit uh, constrained because you are only relying on an image while in a normal consultation, the doctor as well has uh, the historical uh, report of the, of the patient can actually touch the the, the lesion, it can see, for example, if it is filled with pus, with liquid or solid, it can see if it is itchy. There are many data that are missing from, from the foreign image. So to that end, and to build something that actually can be used during routine consultation, we propose uh, what we call real-world multipurpose interpretable, interpretable AI-based tool. So there are several steps that will go through all of them. But uh, of course, it starts directly with the acquisition of the images during the consultation, with this the extraction of the main lesions that you are interested in analyzing, and then doing all the all the analysis uh, that is required to understand what what is going on. So first, I think one of the strongest points of our group right now on this project is the data acquisition and extraction. Why? Because we have recently acquired several machines from. German company PhotoFinder, which has allows you to take full body images uh, with, uh, of high quality polarized uh, uh, with using polarized uh, light uh, in a standardized way, meaning that your patient comes to the to the normal consultation, which is only twenty minutes uh, typically, and even if this patient can typically present hundred or thousand of lesions, you can. Uh, picture all of them in a relatively uh, short time, meaning that you are not uh, uh, being too invasive in the normal life of, of this patient. And then you actually are uh, capturing the lesions that maybe in the future, since there are follow-up pieces, can develop in the melanoma. There is no way that uh, you can, uh, in the early stages, predict that a lesion will become melanoma. So by acquiring in a standardized way with the same conditions always of lighting, uh, sizes and everything, it will allow us in the future, if unfortunately one of these patients will develop melanoma, will actually have the full evolution of, of, of this lesion, which I, is, is something that is normally not done. Because as we said, the patient comes only when the repetition is already uh, developed. And uh, is also, I don't think it's a standard way to proceed by doing full uh, body acquisition of every patient that comes and of course have the same general consent. So also having this kind of full body images allowed us to, to go for personalized models. I mean, in, in, uh, in dermatology, not all the lesions uh, 
uh, are the same, for example, depending on the body part, the skin that we have in the back, it's not the same as the face pan, it's not the same that you have in your chest or in your, or in your cheek, for example. Then you have, of course, the dermoscopic, uh, like age, gender, all these kind of things. And you have also the skin tone. Right now, the, the data sets that are available uh, for public, uh, for academic publications are just a compendium of many images coming from different sources, meaning that they have been acquired uh, with different lights. Also, the dermoscopic images present many times a gel, meaning that you will have some bubbles in the image. They also have sometimes then the marker to, uh, with a, with a pen to, to locate where is the lesion, meaning that you also have to do some kind of pre-processing of the images. All this pre-processing of the images will affect your input data set. What we are proposing here is acquiring all with the same machine, in the same conditions, in the same position, meaning that we will also minimize the time of the pre-processing and also the, the loss of information that is pre-processing. So I think this is really a strong point of, of this study, and it will help us in the future to, to, to produce personalized models going towards this direction of personalized health. I mean, when you go to dermatologists, they will already have probably a model matching your skin tone, the Cecil Patrick uh, index, uh, maybe the type of work that you are, if you work outside or not, and all these kind of things. So, now that we have all the all the lesions acquired, if we have this full body or white uh, ray, uh, region lesions, uh, surface lesions, a normal patient can present hundreds or, or thousands of lesions. And a dermatologist, even a board certificate and a dermatologist with a lot of experience, have only 20 minutes uh, time during a consultation, meaning that it's very challenging to really look at all of them. The strong point, of course, is their experience. They can disregard some lesions immediately and they can try to focus all on the ones that they, they, they are interested in. But in order to make their life easier, I think uh, one of the tasks that you has been very well developed over the years in machine learning from the very beginning is object, object detection, recognition, and localization. For example, you, can, you have the typical example of the self-driving cars that can identify if there is a a uh, peaton or if there's another car, there's a traffic light. So there you have this regional CNNs or YOLO. In our case, we are using YOLO, you look only once, that because all, it also works quite well in video, meaning that you can also go around the, the patient with a camera live and this uh, in life, uh, uh, the algorithm will uh, identify the visions. Here you have an example. I have put a small, uh, small region of the body just for privacy issues, of course. But you can see that the, the algorithm is able to detect all the all the all the lesions that are present in this part, just the upper part of the of the knee. Then the algorithm will uh, you need to train this algorithm to provide a data set with the with the class, the label that you want, and also the bounding box. Using this bounding box is how this algorithm will be able to crop and then it will extract all the lesions and save in a given secure folder. Uh, then the dermatologist or general practitioner will come. He will choose uh, one of the uh, lesions that he thinks can be of interest. And then you can use a normal classifier uh, that is used in many other applications to have a first prediction of the diagnosis. Already here, you, you have certain information because it will give you a probability. In this case, maybe it will say melanoma 95%, but they, it will give you also probability of the other cases. And this will also add more information to the, to the doctor to see, because sometimes when you have some traces of other category, maybe it can raise other questions. But this, let's say this is the normal uh, proceed and what is being published in many cases, you have your lesions, uh, you have your data set, you analyze them, and you classify. We think that this is not only enough because then uh, in all these topics where there is um, where there is uh, accountability for the decisions, meaning, for example, if you are watching this stream uh, uh, platforms where you have videos and the machine learning algorithm suggests you a movie or a TV series that you don't like, there is actually no impact. You just stop watching it or or just watch the ten first minutes and that's it. You're not going to, to denounce that uh, or to complain. 
However, when we are talking about the clinical uh, healthcare uh, topics, of course, there is a contability. If you, for example, there are many applications that you can find online where you are supposed to upload a photo of a lesion of yours, and the algorithm should classify. But this, this of course, uh, has a lot of legal consequences, meaning that if this application is very, meaning even works very well, but maybe is badly used by the user, it can skip the diagnosis of a cancer. Meaning that we need to understand uh, to understand how the algorithms are working and to try to get more information for that. Uh, in, this is what I I mentioned in the title as interpretability. Interpretability is not understanding the mathematics of, behind the models, but trying to get from the models human level concepts, meaning uh, concepts that the the user can understand and maybe are mimicking the diagnosis process that they do normally in their in their in their consultation. So the first thing that uh, I want to explain here is the testing concept with activation vector. This was first proposed by uh, Google uh, research group in Google Brain, and this is based on you have your uh, your neural network already trained that will classify in a number of categories, uh, but then you want to see for example, uh, a number of concepts, what is the importance of these concepts when it comes to the decision process. Here is the sample that they have in their paper. So here they want to see in the cases where you have classified an image as a zebra, how, uh, how much is important the concept of stripes. So for that, they have built a data set with uh, stripes, different colors, and then they have a random data set with other images that has nothing to do. So you select an internal layer here in, 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 the, in your classifier to see in that particular layer what is the importance of the concept uh, stripe in the decision. So at the end, it's a final uh, linear classifier. And this vector is what is called activation vector, meaning that uh, if this value is higher, it will give you more uh, importance of this particular concept in the decision process. For our case in the, in the dermatology, uh, you have to build a dedicated data set. Hopefully, or luckily, we have already uh, another group that has built to start testing this concept, uh, PSU data set is called, where you have uh, different lesions. Uh, they are categorized according to symmetry, color, or features. So you have here an example of features, but you have some networks, regular streaks, regression structures, and regular dots, and so on. And lower here, you have an example. So you have for the different uh, for the different type of lesions. So you have melanoma, nevi, and the others. It will tell you each color corresponds to one of these features. It will tell you how much importance of this feature has in the in the prediction uh, value of, of, of for this particular uh, image that you are analyzing. So this is very interesting because it allows the user to ask certain relevant questions to the model. The model is giving you a prediction, but you want to see, okay, how much of that prediction is based on the bluish color or the fact that it's anti-symmetric or the fact that it presents uh, global. So it actually reinforced the trust of the user, especially if the user is not very much into IT or machine learning or AI. It will still enhance the trust on this model. Then uh, another very popular mo uh, method, uh, is to find similar images in a given data set. It's called, it's called content based image retrieval. For that, you use uh, an encoder, an autoencoder, but basically you use only the first part of the encoder. So you have your training data set with many different examples, and then the encoder will reduce the dimensions uh, to, to a very small uh, number of features. And then, depending how you are, you are. Uh, in this, you can select different metrics to compare the, the features that you get from the training set and the features uh, that you get from the original. By comparing the distance between these two features, typically with Euclidean distance, you can get a, a value that will allow you to compare how close these two images are. This is similar to just a doctor or looking in the bibliographer for similar cases that look similar to what they are looking. But in this case, it allowed us uh, allow you to do it in automatic way, a much faster 
and maybe actually finds uh, all these all these uh, samples. Of course, are are labeled, but the label is not used during the the calculus of the distance. It's just uh, comparing the the features. But once you have the the main the closest uh, uh, cases, you can go to the label and it can maybe raise new questions why uh, certain classes look like the other, and so on. So. Then uh, another one which I, I believe is, is pretty interesting in the way that they present the data is dimensionality reduction using um, a new proposed method called UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation Projection. Uh, you probably have used and are familiar with other methods like PCA, PSNE, UMAP. Uh, uh, PCA is, uh, in general, tries to preserve more the, lo the global data structure. PSNA maybe focus more on the local. And UMAP actually improves a bit PSN going, uh, preserving both local and global data structure. I mean, there are some papers you can see at the bottom of, of the slide if you want more information. Uh, within the UMAP, there is another implementation, which is because normally UMAP will use will work either with images or with uh, quantitative data that uh, you will actually reduce the dimensions to the main uh, to the ones that best describe uh, your your data set. But then there is also the possibility of doing the same embedding using the the, ne the neural network work, uh, weights. So you have uh, your input images. And you have uh, trained your neural network, and this will give you certain categories. You can use UMAP to represent this, this uh, the result of the use of this neural network, but preserving the, the, the global structure of, of the graph, meaning that instead of, be, of having points which are, seems to be uncorrelated, but you have given them a class, but they, they seem to be all over the place, you actually can keep the, the structure of, of, the, of, the, of your data set and actually see uh, clusters of the data. For example, this is an example using the, the very well-known data set means, which is just handwritten uh, digits. And you can see how the different colors correspond to all the digits. And you can see how this UMAT is able to clusterize and separate all the, all the, all the different images into the correct category and far away. The interesting thing of this for the user is actually if there is some dubious uh, diagnosis and you have a point which in between two clusters, the distance between, I mean, within this new uh, set of coordinates is actually meaningful, meaning that if it, it doesn't really belong to a cluster, but it's closer, it's, it's meaningful than, it's more meaningful that it's actually farther to another cluster, even if it is not actually within that cluster. So I think that could, it's also a very nice uh, way to actually show, because you are using the same uh, neural network that you have trained at the beginning to give you the classification, but you are extracting the information in a different way. So finally, this is okay. We have all our tools that can be optimized. You can get better results. You can even aim for a couple of publications, but our final aim is actually to deploy this during dermatology consultation. I mean, we have the advantage that dermatology uh, Consultations are not invasive, so the patient comes, the dermatology looks around the patient, and, and that's it, and the patient leaves. So it's possible to, 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 to do this in an easier way than, for example, if you need MRI images or CT scans. Something. So you will have your, your, your doctor that has performs an exploratory phase, let's say. It will look through the patient, it will extract all the lesions, it will select some of them. And already, before the patient leaves, it can run these pre-trained models. These models, of course, are heavy, so they should be training in cluster or a small uh, cluster, that, I mean, proper cluster by the Swiss Supercomputing Center or a small cluster that sometimes uh, different groups have in their, own, in, their own, in their own offices. And already, this is just an illustration. The, the user can have yes, a, a Wii, where it can select the, the analysis and it can perform the TCAF to see for a given lesion which are the features that are driven the, the decision making. It can also find other cases that look similar from a visual point of view or from a feature point of view on, on the, of the lesion that you, they are looking at. Or finally, they can also present more visually where this uh, lesion that you are looking at lies uh, within the other 
other clusters or other systems. I mean, this is, is it feasible to be done. It could be used just uh, using directly the images acquired by the photo finder and then apply uh, this framework of uh, multi-purpose algorithm that I have explained. Uh, or we, or it can, or can be do as well with a powerful laptop where you have already uh, made available all these uh, all these algorithms and maybe you need uh, to attach a, a camera that has polarized light to uh, this is very important because in academia you can always publish uh, very interesting papers and you can justify them they will be reviewed they will give you uh, they will make proof of concept that these algorithms works. And I think right now nobody doubts that you can actually classify the different skin lesions according, uh, using uh, machine learning. But if you want to make it actually, or to introduce it uh, slowly in the routine consultation, you have to make something that can be understood. And that way, I mean, in the interpretable for the, for, the, for the user. And also it should not, interfere too much in their common practice. I mean, maybe they, they select a couple of patients that are willing to, to, to be used as guinea pig, but of course, it cannot change completely the way they, they are performing their, their practice. Um, so yes, to, to finish, uh, I, I just want to summarize a little bit what I have presented here. Uh, sorry, I couldn't go in more detail, maybe in some technical parts, but again, if you, are, if you have some references in the slides and if, anything you can contact me. But we have evaluated the needs and challenges of use AI during actual routine consultation, not only uh, staying in academic uh, environment. Uh, for that, we need, uh, it's, it's vital to have a real world data set is, and not just a compendium of, of images that you can get from different sources that you are not sure what is the, uh, the background of these patients or how the images were taken, and it will, it will require too much pre-processing, losing information. But the good thing as well is that actually we will have the longitudinal evolution of the lesion, meaning that if any of the lesions starts as a very innocent lesion, but it develops into a melanoma, we would have uh, recorded all the evolution. And this, this, this data is really precious uh, in order to be really early diagnosis, because of course, as we said before, the patient only comes when the symptoms are already there. So it's very difficult to, to go before that, that moment. So to improve acceptance and usability, uh, the user has to be confident of what the model is doing. So for that, we have present these different methods that present uh, interesting information uh, using human level, uh, human level concepts. And finally, we we are aiming to, at some point, to deploy it during team consultation, and I think it shouldn't be a real problem because it's not invasive. It can be done during the time that the, the consultation lasts, and it's, uh, and the feedback we will get from the from the different users, of course, will be vital to improve and to see some things that maybe we are missing or they are actually not working as they should be. The, the, the ultimate test is to give it to the user, as we know. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.